So I've been working at the Sainsbury Lab for 35 years, which is more than half my life. And I've been very privileged to do so. And I work on how plants resist disease. I work on the plant immune system. So plants are really good at defending themselves. They have powerful defense mechanisms, but they only work when the plant perceives when a pathogen shows up and activates defense. And I'll return to that theme later. Now, I've been working using what I'll be referring to as the GM method for 40 years. And I'm starting at a, a small startup ag biotech company in California in 1983. And um, yeah, none of my creations have bit me yet. But anyway, I hope to reassure you on the safety of the method and talk a bit about the potential and make the case for a more proportionate regulatory framework so its benefits can be realized on all of our behalves. Right, so this is the cover or part of the cover of this report that just came out, the links in the chat. What I'm basically going through is what I went through for an all-party parliamentary group in uh, London where we launched the report. So anyway, I'll take you through what I took, went through with them. So my first point, and I wanted to express appreciation to the government for this, because there's a lot to pillory them for, but something I think they've definitely got right is with the Precision Breeding Act, not just in principle, but they've also been very effective at taking it uh, forward, getting it on the statute book. So I want to thank the government and the dedicated civil servants who've turned it into reality. So what the Precision Breeding Act enables you to do is to use a method called gene editing, whereby you can tweak genes uh, within a plant variety to uh, adjust the performance or, or actually maybe in some cases cause mutations that improve uh, the plant. So that's a great step forward. Gene editing is a great technology, but like gene editing, the gen what's come to be known as genetic modification is a great method to increase and protect crop yields replace chemistry with genetics. So I guess that's my own passion, working on plant disease and pest resistance. I want to be able to replace all that chemistry that gets applied with genetics, so you don't have to apply it. The benefits are pretty obvious. There's no risk of collateral damage to other organisms, whether you don't have to spray the chemistry, you don't have to buy diesel and, track, and take your tractors up and down, compacting the soil and uh, emitting CO2. If you can avoid all that, it's got to be a good thing. So, as I say, I've been using the method for 40 years, and every learned society that's looked at it has concluded there's nothing about it that's any more risky than regular plant breeding. Implementation of the rules about using the method in the EU uh, is dysfunctional and adds excessive costs and delay. However, the rules themselves allow for discretion by regulators on derogation for some components of the dossier. And, of course, what I have as a target is the requirement or 90-day rodent feeding trials for everything where the GM method's been used, uh, a completely pointless animal welfare abomination where you learn nothing. I mean, I'm going to expand on that later. So outside the EU, you know, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, we can implement the regulations more proportionally because we have imported the uh, EU regulations on using the GM method. Well, this slide's in the time-honored tradition of telling you what I'm going to tell you, and now I'm going to get into telling you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. This is a point that is um, familiar to you all online, I'm sure. You can't take food production for granted. You need high yields. The better the yield, the less land you need to produce the same amount of food. Without high yielding varieties, food prices would be higher. We'd need more land for agriculture. We have a quote in the report. I think 88% of the gain in UK wheat yields between 1960 and 2010, something like that, could be attributed to genetics and 12% to better agronomy. So Continued genetic improvement is essential. And, and it's not trivial. We need every tool in the toolbox, especially as yields, at least in wheat, have been leveling off. Now, a particular gripe about the term genetically modified, because it is actually an utterly stupid term. Because all of the crops that we grow have been genetically modified from their wild ancestors. And this is most conspicuously illustrated. This is what maize used to look like. This is Tiacinti through various generations of crossing and breeding. It went via this to this, and the, but you, you wouldn't believe they were the same plant just from the, looking at the appearance. And, and the same is true over here. We've got watermelon, aubergine, broccoli, brassicas, carrots, uh, and so on. Most crops are barely recognizable in their wild ancestors. They've already been genetically modified. So I try and scrupulously talk about use of the GM method for crop improvement, and not genetically modified organisms, because... All of our crops are already genetically modified. Some of the alarm about using the method has been on the basis of naturalness, and there are those who believe it's unnatural to use the GM method for crop improvement. I'd say it was nothing like as unnatural as moving maize, tomato, potato, sunflower, etc., from South America to Europe. 
uh, where they'd never previously been grown. That's, that's what I call a serious environmental impact, much bigger than anything achieved with the GM method. So what's been done with it? I'll just show you a f- several examples. Actually, there's a long list of examples in the report, especially in Annex A at the end. You can uh, read at your leisure. Um, but this is one of the first applications. This is um, the use of the method saved the Hawaiian papaya industry. So on the left are plants, are papaya plants infected with papaya ring spot virus, virus, and on the right, are uh, plants that were also infected with papyrus ring spot virus, but they've been genetically modified to add sequences that mean that when the virus shows up, it gets silenced and shut down. And uh, there's a bit of public sector project between Cornell University and the University in Hawaii. It was just basically given away to growers in the uh, mid 90s. And without it, there wouldn't be a, a industry in Hawaii. Uh, and it's been adopted in the Philippines. I think there's still some, and, and in China, but I think there's still some uh, disagreement about adopting it in Thailand, but it's spreading uh, and as, as well it should. Here's another example. So th- there's a bacterium called the Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, or BT, and it makes a, a crystal protein which is toxic to larvae of insects. So some are toxic to Lepidopteran, you know, moths and butterfly insects, and some are toxic to beetles, Coleopteran. But anyway, this is an example of something that's toxic to Lepidopteran larvae, uh, and the, this is a, a pest that is a, causes enormous amounts of damage in Bangladesh in the eggplant slash aubergine. And you express this protein in it, which is the same protein as in the bacteria that organic farmers spray to control insect pests. But then you can convert a plant that's on, that's on the left, riddled with pest, to ones that are resistant. You can't do this with gene editing. So what's the difference between GM and gene editing? GM, you actually move new genes into your recipient. Plant. Of course, plants have got many tens of thousands of genes, so you're not making a big difference, just adding a few genes uh, to, the, to add a, a specific beneficial property. Uh, and in the US, Bt maize and cotton have dramatically reduced uh, insecticide use, uh, and they've done so elsewhere as well. So here's a, a graph of the adoption from 1996 of Bt corn, uh, Bt cotton, herbicide tolerant cotton, herbicide tolerant soybeans, herbicide tolerant corn. And sometimes you'll get varieties of maize, let's say, corn that carry both Bt and the herbicide tolerance gene. You can see basically nearly all the three major commodity crops in the US, and the same is pretty much true of rapeseed as well. You know, it, it has a, a GM component in the pedigree, and that's partly why they're so productive. Uh, this is another sort of poster child exemplification of using the method. Um, 250 million children in the world are vitamin A deficient, uh, and vitamin A deficiency blinds five hundred half a million children a year, and most of them die. And if they if you have very impoverished farmers that submit, subsist primarily on rice, then you're going to get vitamin A deficiency. And if you could supplement the uh, composition of the rice with a vitamin A precursor, and that's what is in the golden rice, then when those children eat that golden rice, they will not succumb to vitamin A deficiency. They'll still be very poor. You know, it's still a scandal how poor they are, but you'll be doing something useful if you supply uh, a vitamin A-containing rice that, comp- that, that um, restores vitamin A in their diets. Now, this is one you won't have heard of, I suspect, but this is a rather clever method of controlling weeds invented by a Mexican researcher, Luis Herrera Estrella. So you all know, you'll all be well aware that uh, NPK are required for your crops to grow well. And the P usually comes in the form of phosphate uh, with uh, four oxygens on the phosphorus atom. If you don't supply phosphorus, and, and this is a model system where you've got a wild grass called brachypodium, and you, your model crop is um, just for experimental purposes, and this experiment is tobacco. If you supply phosphate, then the, you've got the grass and the crop or tobacco grow better, but basically the grass wins. However, there's an alternative way of supplying phosphorus, and that is to supply phosphite instead of phosphate. Uh, phosphite is actually used on in turf to um, control some root diseases, but plants can't use phosphite as a source of phosphorus. But if you put into them an enzyme uh, from a, a pseudomonas strain uh, called PTXD, then your crop can actually use phosphite. So then if you supply phosphite and your crop can uh, use phosphite and the weed can't, then the, then the crop wins. So this is actually a way of controlling weeds that doesn't involve herbicide. It replaces a herbicide 
with a different way of giving your crop a competitive uh, advantage. And again, you can't do this with editing. So I've used the word genes a lot. So let me just expand a little bit on what the word means. So most plants carry at least 30,000 genes. So tomato would carry like 30, 35,000 genes. And then a potato will be at least double that because of uh, it's tetraploid instead of uh, diploid. And um, genes mostly encode the amino acid sequence of a protein. So that every protein could contain one of 20 amino acids at any particular position. And that is specified by the sequence of the gene. So what are the proteins? Proteins are tiny machines that do a chemical job, an enzyme or a physical job, e.g. muscle proteins. And mutations in the genes alter or, or, mod or change or lose protein function. And the fact is that crops and their ancestors carry enormous genetic variation. And I'll expand on that in a minute. That, and that's variation is what's been used by plant breeders. So here's my favorite nature-based solution. It involves this plant pathogen, agrobacterium, that causes crown galls. You may have seen crown galls on trees in your neighborhood uh, caused by agrobacterium. And what it does naturally is to deliver DNA into cells of plants that it causes disease on. So what there's a, it has a simple mechanism, and there's a real triumph of plant science to figure out how this works. It chops a bit of DNA out, called the tDNA for transferred DNA. And I won't go into too much detail, but what it does when it goes into the plant cell is to enslave that plant cell. So it makes compounds only the agrobacterium can use. And, I'll, um, I'll, and, and also it promotes uh, unrestrained growth, which is why you get this gall. Now, what you can do is you can chop out the genes for all the functions you don't want and put, replace them with genes for functions you do want. And then uh, when you expose the agrobacterium to a plant that's got, and this is the cartoon of six chromosomes in a plant, then you expose the agrobacterium with your favoured DNA to the plant. And then some of the DNA from the agrobacterium gets in, the tDNA gets in. And if it carries useful genes like insect control genes, disease control genes, then it confers properties on that plant, the nature-based solution. Uh, it turns out this has been around a very long time. And from, from DNA sequencing, it was discovered actually some crops like sweet potato were, were, were transformed by the agrobacterium tDNA many thousands of years ago. And it's been carrying it around for a long time. So every time you eat some sweet potato, you're actually eating a, 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 a GM crop, even though no individual person imposed that state on it. I want to make another point about GM because it's a method. It's just a method. You may disagree about some of the purposes for which the method is used. I know herbicide tolerance required a lot of controversy, but uh, it's just a method for doing something useful. And uh, so after you add an app to your iPhone, it's still on iPhone, but with added function. After you add a gene to a potato with 60,000 genes, it's still a potato, but it's got some added function. And a lot of people have studied, a lot of um, the Royal Society, the US National Academy of Sciences, the European Academies, many others. The method is no riskier than plant breeding. The method is fine. Let's not get hung up on the method. But the real question is, what do we use it for? And the regulations on the method came from a time when, in the immortal words of Donald Rumsfeld, former Secretary of State for Defense in the US, uh, people thought they might be unknown unknowns we didn't even know we didn't know about. And that is no longer the case. OK, so and, and the other point about the effects of the method is that the, it, the changes we're making are tiny compared to the pre-existing genetic variation that's in any crop species. And the scale of this uh, enormous variation only became clear in the last 10 years of sequencing lots of plant genomes. What I've tried to depict here is a recent analysis in which the DNA was sequenced from a potato variety, actually one called Atlantic, a US variety. Um, so potato has 48 chromosomes, has four sets of 12 chromosomes. So it has four chromosomes one, four chromosomes two, four chromosomes three. And what this is cartoon or this is meant to depict is the amount, the extent to which even the same chromosome can vary even within the same variety. So here's one of the chromosomes one of this variety Atlantic. And here's another one of the chromosome one of this variety Atlantic. And you see what this is meant to represent. There's a whole huge chunk of DNA, like many megabase, many millions of bases that are in this chromosome one, but not in this chromosome one. Here's another over here on chromosome 12. You've got a huge chunk of DNA 
that is in this version of chromosome 12, but not in this version of chromosome 12. And also there's bits of DNA that move around. So this bit of DNA on chromosome four, some of this DNA has ended up over here on chromosome 12. Uh, and that's what all these lines sort of wiggly across here indicate. There's absolute upheaval going on all the time in plant genomes. This is true in maize, this is true in wheat, this is true in everything that's been analyzed with any degree of scrutiny. So the changes we're int introducing by these methods are tiny compared to the massive variation that's already in there. And we've lost all sense of proportion in our regulation of the use of this method. It's actually mad. And now it used to be that you could buy GM stuff that on, in Safeway and Sainsbury's. Uh, and here's a tin from that period. Uh, of course, when the clouds darkened and we could speculate about what, what, what went wrong, and we do a little bit in, in our report, uh, it's partly the push die scandal, so we have a, a box on that you may be interested to read. But anyway, things went wrong and these were withdrawn from the shelves and we entered in a, sort of a dark period. So, yeah, so now I'm going to put a more UK perspective on this. So my colleague, Cathy Martin, has developed these varieties of tomato that have a, a this purple pigment, which is the health promoting pigment that's associated with the health promotion of blueberries, black currants. Uh, blackberries. They're called anthocyanins, these pigments. And with a bit of tweaking and a couple of genes from Antirhinum, the snapdragon, expressed just in the fruit, she, she developed tomatoes that make a lot of these compounds in the fruit. And you can't do this with editing either. And it's not just a gimmick. You may think it is, but it turns out that if you do tests on cancer-prone mice, are called P53 knockout mice, you feed them a diet where you've incorporated either powder from the red tomatoes or from the purple tomatoes. If you feed them the stuff from the purple tomatoes, then they live 30% longer. And given we're all, to varying extents, cancer-prone humans, it's a good thing to get plenty of anthocyanins in your diet. And you're never going to produce them as cheaply as you will if you produce them in a tomato. And these have now been all regulated. We got permission from the US Department of Agriculture. We've been, we've got what council approval from the Food and Drug Administration of the US, not a trivial undertaking. It took th three years. And now here they are on sale, you know, farmers markets in North Carolina. Hippies in tie-dyed t-shirts are queuing up to buy them. And also fancy restaurants. Uh, so this is a restaurant I went to in Boston in July, have on the menu things like this striped bass crudo with apricot salsa and purple tomato. There it is, delicious. If there are any people growing tomatoes in glass houses commercially amongst uh, on the line, probably not, but uh, we, we, we do intend to get approval for uh, production of this, or approval for this uh, material in uh, for cultivation in the UK. Now, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Napier in Rothamsted, developed camelina plants. It's, it's basically, it's a relative of oilseed rape that accumulate high levels of the long chain omega-3 fatty acids that are so important for heart health in the human diet that people normally get from oily fish, um, and when for them to get it, for these compounds to get into the diet of farm salmon in uh, Scotland, those fish need to be fed on anchovies that have been hoovered up from the Pacific off Peru, uh, where they eat little uh, critters that eat little critters that are um, marine algae, where, which have the genes to make uh, this compound. And what Jonathan did was to take genes from those marine algae and express them in the oil seed. So now you can actually, instead of having to you know harvest millions of tons of uh, anchovies to get these compounds into our farm fish, you can actually produce them in an oil seed. My own specialist subject is plant resistance to disease. Um, and resistance has to do, is achieved by recognition of when plant pathogens show up. So plants carry hundreds to thousands of what are called immune receptors. They're basically detectors. They're the radar of plants that detect pathogens and activate defense. And different plants have different repertoires of uh, immune receptors. So plant one might have all these immune receptors here. Plant two might have a different bunch of immune receptors. So you can see there's quite a lot of overlap, but these are immune receptors of plant two are not in plant one and vice versa. So if you want to increase the resistance in plant one, you can get some immune receptors in plant two to plant one. You can't do that with gene editing. You have to use the so-called GM method. If you move immune receptors from one to two, you increase its resistance. So here's an example of that. So there's a very important disease in uh, peppers in southeast United States. There's anthemonas disease, cause of bacterial spec. And this gene in pepper, bacterial spec 2, resistance gene, confers resistance. And it confers, uh, yes, I'm getting ahead of myself there. 
Um, and you can see that if you've got the BS2 gene, then uh, you're resistant. And if you haven't got the BS2 gene, then that's what disease looks like. And if you clone the resistance gene BS2 and put it into tomato, you know, just like I said, you move from plant two to plant one, then you actually have resistance that you didn't have before. And there's no genetic variation for resistance to this disease in tomato. And this doubles a year in Florida field trials. And it's just an immune receptor from something that people are already eating. Um, here's another example of an immune receptor. So Rolstonia, not much of a disease here, bacterial wilt. It um, causes this disease in, in tomato, and there's a, a, a gene from a failcrest, Arabidopsis, called EFR, and you put that into tomato, and you now have resistance to Rolstonia. And there's loads of other examples of this. I'm just showing a few of the highlights here. Now, I, I work on potato late blight. I've been working on it for over 20 years. I guess I started in 98, so 25 years. And we've cloned a lot of genes from wild relatives that encode immune receptors that confer recognition of potato late blight. Uh, and the ones we've been working with are called RP, RP, resistance to photothrin firstans, BNT1, AMR3, and AMR1. They're from wild relatives. Uh, there's also some tuber quality traits. Uh, and um, we've identified lines of Maris Piper that yield indistinguishably from Maris Piper, provided you sprayed them. They yield a lot better if you don't spray them because the Maris Piper gets wiped out by blight. And so this is in partnership with a couple of companies. So the Simplot company has already licensed these genes. So American farmers are benefiting from the use of these genes to grow potatoes, but we can't here. Um, and, and this is the tuber blight resistance. So if you here's your control. So you don't inoculate, then you don't get disease. If you inoculate with late blight, two weeks later, it looks like this. But the gene, the, the, the lines that we made, basically Maris Piper, but with these additional genes, it's completely resistant. And the same thing works in, uh, in Africa with a different set of immune receptors. These are resistant plants in the back. And these ones, there used to be some potatoes, but they all died. And the same kind of thing works for rust resistance in wheat. We is a, some plants that have a five gene cassette for rust resistance. So this is this carries that five gene cassette. They're complete, completely resistant, much more res resistant than many of the things that are called uh, resistant. The stem rust resistance 45, 55. They're not as susceptible as some of these guys, but they're weak resistances. But the stack, all these recognition capacities, gives complete resistance. And here's another consideration as to why we should be using genetics, not chemistry, to protect our crops. So the first point is, as, as I'm sure um, any growers will be aware, mycorrhizal fungi play an important role in mineral nutrition of the plant, uh, so-called vascular mycorrhizal uh, fungi. And uh, if you spray with fungicides, you kill the mycorrhizal fungi. And, and this, is, uh, this is what this paper is about from, 20, uh, from last year. Uh, you reduce the population of beneficial fungi if you spray with a lot of fungicides. It's not surprising, but uh, it's, it's a re another reason to not be spraying if you can avoid it. Uh, another reason is that many of the compounds that are used to treat fungal diseases of crops, like the azoles, are also used in, in humans when they catch, for example, aspergillus infection of the lung. A uh, farmer's lung, I think, is uh, often uh, is an aspergillus. So what you don't want to have is that aspergillus infection be resistant to fungicides. So the more you spray with fungicides, the more you select for resistance to fungicides. So let's see if we can control disease with genetics instead of chemistry. And now, this is sort of a general point I often make. People talk about how to cope with the energy security challenge and climate change. And my purpose really here is to try and avoid conversations that you sometimes get into where somebody says, no, all you need is better insulation, or all you need is electric cars, or all you need is renewables, or all you need is nuclear. You know, you need all of these. And similarly, for food security and climate change, I would argue, and you might, some of you may contest that top one, reduce meat consumption. We could discuss that if you want. But um, we need better genetics from, from plant breeding. You need, you need the GM method. You need editing. You need, there's lots of scope for improvement of agronomy, especially as the mechanization and AI and drones and, and so on. Uh, we, we want to reduce food waste. And these are not mutually exclusive. Let's avoid false antitheses. So GM is a useful method, just a method to help increase pest and disease resistance to help weed control and reduce the environmental impact of agriculture and enhance nutrition. Here's a point I want to make. Uh, I can't say this too strongly. The coal industry killed people. It got regulated. The pharmaceutical industry killed people. I mean, it made some mistakes. It got regulated. The chemical industry, uh, et cetera. 
the, the genetics industry with this method, it's been subjected to this incredible regulation on the basis of completely hypothetical hazards or risks. It's all based on conjuncture. And this is another term for the so-called precautionary principle. And I would argue that if you make any rules based on the precautionary principle, they should be time limited because you need a post-cautionary principle for when uncertainty is replaced by certainty, as it has been. When the facts change or when the facts materialize, because we, we had no facts when these regulations were made, we can and should change our minds. One of the reasons for doing this is that both parties will agree that there's, we're having a problem in the UK with economic growth. And if you have excessive regulation, it will slow economic growth. And there's tremendous scope for a burgeoning genetics industry as, as part of the bioeconomy if we have proportionate regulation. And that's part of the opportunity cost. The road's not taken. We keep talking ourselves out of using the method. So there are, for example, at least two different approaches for controlling flea beetle and rapeseed. And without that control and removal of neonics, the uh, planting of oilseed rape in the UK has gone down something like 50% in the last six or seven years. Sugar beet yellows, we got genetic solutions to sugar beet yellows. We, shouldn't, we don't need to spray with all the insecticides we've been spraying. And you know, everybody's saying, oh, we can't do it because it's GM. It's mad. And so it's time to move on from the gene editing goods, GM bad narrative, they're both good. So then the question arises, how do we do that? And my colleague, Johnny Hazel, who I co-wrote the proposal, uh, the report with, talked everyone through the next section, and I'll try and do justice to what he said about it. So in the UK, there's been various reports from learner bodies from various departments about smarter regulation. Regulation should be pro-innovation, stimulate demand for science and technology and attract investment while representing UK values and safeguarding citizens. Bayes, uh, uh, whatever its success is called, some of the current standards inherited in the EU are based on an overly restrictive and often disproportionate interpretation of the precautionary principle. We, we also got some quotes here from the Advisory Committee on Release of the Environment, ACO, which is the body mandated by DEFRA to uh, rule on um, GM crops. It's difficult to find any compelling evidence that the techniques used for trait manipulation, i.e. the method, have any bearing on the environmental consequences of release. In other words, what method has been used is useless as a predictor of whether or not there's going to be bad consequences. The, what is a predictor is the actual trait that's gone in and its properties it confers. Uh, US National Academy of Sciences, no substantial evidence that foods from GM crops were less safe than foods from non-GM crops. Uh, Aker also said environmental risk assessments in the, in the EU are overly formulaic. And as a consequence, there's, there's a tendency for them to contain information that does not help inform decision makers about the risk of adverse effects. And with the result, they turn into open-ended data gathering exercises. So we suggest, or actually Aker suggest, and we echo their suggestion, that we should be making judgments based on defined hypotheses of how an adverse effect might arise from the specific GM crop with a specific trait under field conditions. So we have this little uh, decision tree here based on what we re regard as sensible. Is there previous regulatory experience? If there is, is there a plausible mechanism for how the product could lead to a harm? If there is, then there needs to be work done by the developer assessing whether the individual product is harmful compared to products that are not are derived from a GM variety. And based on that, you can justify to seek derogation. If you've got regulatory experience with similar species, traits, or methods of action, can then ask whether there's a scientific reason to believe this product could be harmful. If the answer is yes, then you've got to do some scrutiny. But if the answer is no, then you seek derogation. And this may be what is process put in place, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago in the US called the APHIS review by the USDA. It's a much more case-by-case -case assessment of whether a, a modified plant could be, could give rise to an increased risk of being a plant pest. And if there isn't, then it's not subject to regulation. It's approved. And this is what happens with a purple tomato. And the benefits are you can develop technology, not just develop it, but bring it to public use. Right. So that's the end of my pitch.